Well, hello, students. This is Professor Khan once again. Uh, I'd like to walk you through the second part of our central idea slideshow uh, and presentation. If you have not uh, viewed the first part of this presentation, please do that first uh, and then come back to part two. Uh, in part one, we uh, talked a little bit about uh, literary theory and, and the concept of ambiguity. Uh, we talked about formalism and we sort of ended that first part talking about the three different types of effects um, that uh, short stories can leave upon readers, sort of three, I suppose, categories of, of effects. And we decided at the end of that presentation that uh, we would focus our attention this term on the central idea. So this second part of the uh, central idea uh, slideshow uh, presentation really focuses on the central idea. The central idea is a, um, a statement uh, that you will want to include uh, in uh, virtually all of your papers for my class, starting with paper number one. Uh, and if you go back and look at the paper one instructions, you will see that after you give your page and a half, page and three quarters long plot summary of the story you've chosen, uh, either the Baldwin or the Cather story, then you are to write uh, one sentence that captures that story's central idea. So let's talk a little bit about what a central idea is. A central idea is an idea that is suggested by the story. It is a reasoned out uh, critical thought based on the story and the story elements, in particular character and conflict, I would say. Uh, it's based on, you know, the situation that the characters find themselves in. Uh, action, the plot points that occur, but again, I think it's primarily rooted in the character's story arc, sort of the, the journey, if you will, that the character takes over the course of the story and the conflict or the conflicts that that character has to deal with. A central idea is an idea that reflects the nature of the story's main character. Uh, it reflects the discoveries, the emotions, the experiences, the changes that that main character experiences over the course of the story during that character's story arc. So one thing that we need to really consider uh, when we read one of these short stories, and especially when we're trying to compose a central idea statement, is what change or what changes does the character go through as a result of, you know, facing the conflicts in the story, facing the situations, dealing with other characters and so forth? We'll be talking much more about character and conflict with paper two. Uh, a central idea is a statement that communicates something about the human experience, something about the human condition and or perhaps something about the way that the world works, at least in terms of the experiences of the character in the story. Um, you know, if we can use the analogy of a, of a mouse in a cage, uh, that mouse uh, is, is trying to get to the other side where the cheese is and faces all of these obstacles on the way. Uh, and we learn about, you know, mouse nature, so to speak, uh, by looking at that. Well, we sort of have that same experience with a short story. We have a main character who is a human being of a certain type of personality, a certain type of characteristics, faced with certain types of conflicts and situations. And they either, you know, get the cheese at the end or they don't. Uh, but certainly on that journey, we learn about that character. And so we can ultimately after reading the story and thinking about it a little bit, we can come up with uh, a statement that sort of captures um, that nature, that, that aspect or those aspects of human nature that we see playing out over the course of the story. 
A central idea is a statement that may, uh, at the same time, comment on human psychology or sociology. It may, perhaps, depending on the story, even comment on a philosophical matter or a moral or ethical concern as it pertains to the main character. So there's all there's there's all kinds of possibilities for statements of central idea, um, and a lot of that is going to be determined, you know, by the specific story that you're looking at. Uh, a uh, central idea is applicable to some people in the world, perhaps all people in the world, perhaps people of a certain type of personality, people in a certain situation. Uh, and again, and I know you can't necessarily see this entire slide, but if the story, if we agree that a short story r realistically, to some degree, realistically captures human experience or human nature, then the idea is that that main character is going to be realistically reflecting human nature back at us. And so we want to consider that and try to sum up the nature of that character and what we learn about how that character acts and reacts based on certain uh, constraints, certain situations, certain conflicts. And that statement that we produce uh, capturing that idea is, uh, is going to probably be a pretty good central idea statement. A central idea, uh, regardless of how we come about it, uh, should be easily supportable with what we call textual evidence. And that is simply evidence from the text. So starting in paper two, um, I'm going to have you write about the central idea, but more specifically how the elements of character and conflict help to bring about that central idea. And you're going to want to make some claims about that, but you need to support those claims with evidence from the story. And that basically means quotes from the story, paraphrases from the story, you know, referring to specific parts of the story that seem to support uh, those ideas and those connections. A central idea should also capture the, the greatest percentage of the story as possible. I mean, it really should capture the entire story. You can't as, as I've said before, you can't just read a story and, you know, ignore, you know, one quarter of it or ignore those five pages in the middle that you don't understand. Um, if you don't understand something in a story, you need to ask. You need to, you know, make an appointment with me, uh, meet up with a tutor, talk it out with other students. You know, there are ways that we can get you toward understanding, but you can't just ignore stuff in a story because if you do, you're going to go down the wrong path in terms of capturing a central idea statement and in terms of making good argument about the story. Really, the only wrong interpretation of a central idea is the one that is unsupported, the one that is incomplete, uh, that doesn't take into account everything that it needs to take into account. Uh, or what I might call the left field interpretation, where we um, become very liberal in our own personal interpretations of a short story and uh, interpret what's going on in a story in a way that perhaps the majority of people or the status quo um, really cannot see or quite understand. So ultimately, in this presentation, we're going to turn to Raymond Carver's Story Cathedral for examples of, of central idea. Um, but before we do that, let's talk about what a central idea is not. A central idea goes beyond simply stating subject matter in the story. All right? When I say subject matter, I'm talking about the content of the story. Right from our uh, part one of the slideshow, we talked a little bit about the form content relationship and how formalism likes to examine that. The content of a story is going to be, oh, you know, the type of character that that uh, is is the main character, um, you know, specifically. 
like what type of person is this is this character uh what is the what what does the character do what are the plot points in the story what what is the action in the story um what sort of specific conflicts does the character get involved in now character plot conflict are also form choices so we want to look at them in terms of form and what sort of choices the writer makes but once the writer makes those choices then those things sort of start turning into the content of the story as well so we just don't want to repeat content so for instance in carver we have an unnamed narrator. I suppose we can call him Bub. Robert calls him Bub, right? And his wife, and then we have Robert, the wife's friend who's come to visit. Those are the, the three characters in the story. That's subject matter. Uh, the story takes as its subject these three characters interacting with each other. Um, the thing that's going on with these three characters is all about this visit that Robert is taking. Uh, and it's a visit that ultimately affects and changes the narrator at least a little bit. We have a conflict between the wife and the narrator. We call that an external conflict. Uh, I think we've also got internal conflict within the narrator himself. Um, in terms of like setting, you know, the story is set. It's not, it's not crystal clear from the story exactly where it's set, but I can tell you that the story is really set in sort of suburban America. Uh, it's taking place in New York state somewhere. Um, and Carver was very interested in his stories and sort of probing and interrogating uh, sort of the uh, the suburban American dream, so to speak, and how it goes wrong. Um, and this is one of those stories. So, you know, we have this sort of setting where, you know, the characters are living in this comfortable suburban house and setting. Um, these are all aspects of content, subject matter in the story. We don't want to have a central idea statement that just calls out these things. It would be wrong or incorrect to simply repeat subject matter in a central idea statement. So it would be wrong to write something like the central idea of Carver's story is a visit by a blind man that helps a biased, depressed man change. A central idea statement is not the same as a one sentence summary of the plot of a story. The first sentence of your plot summary is going to be something similar to that. It's going to be a one sentence capture of the plot of the story. And that, of course, is going to deal with the subject matter of the story. That is not what a central idea tries to do. A central idea, furthermore, goes beyond stating the themes of the story. Now, I want to be <clears throat> careful about this because there are some professors who use the word theme and central idea interchangeably. They use the word both both terms to mean the same thing. I'm going to differentiate between the two. I think that there's a difference between these two terms. A theme is an important idea or concept that the story deals with. So in Cathedral, we have several themes in play. Uh, we have the theme of bias and discrimination even, certainly ignorance on the part of our narrator. Um, you know, the guy's not like a, a total, you know, total jerk. I mean, he's not, <clears throat> he's, he's, he's kind of a closet, um, uh, a discrimin discriminatory character. He's sort of a closet, uh, he has sort of a closet bias uh, against people with disabilities. And he seems to be a bit of a closet racist as well, you know, when he, when he talks um, about uh, Robert's deceased wife. Um, it's not like he's, you know, w wearing a Klan hood marching in the streets or anything like this. But, you know, he is as we can see reading the story, he is definitely ignorant. He's definitely have some, some biases um, about people 
and he does uh, seem to be a little bit discriminatory. Uh, jealousy, he's definitely a jealous uh, character, and that seems to be part of the fuel um, uh, burning the fire of the, uh, the conflict between the wife and the narrator. Uh, we have the theme of marriage and marital strife. Uh, we have a theme about making new friends and meeting new people. Uh, we have uh, sort of a, a more, maybe more philosophical theme of enlightenment and new experiences and how new experiences can open you up to greater understandings. Uh, like I said before, we have this theme that, that's common in a lot of Carver stories about suburban malaise, sort of this, this idea that, you know, the suburban home with the front and the backyard and the two cars in the garage is, you know, sort of the American dream, but it's in some ways a very empty dream. If you're, if you're not fulfilled personally, then all that stuff really doesn't mean anything. Bub seems to me to be a pretty depressed character. I mean, he drinks and smokes pot every night and sleeps, you know, separately from his wife and stuff. So there seems to be some depression in the, in the story on the part of Bub and, and probably the wife as well, frankly. Uh, we've got the theme of that American dream and the failure of the dream. And we have other themes as well, but I would say that's a good healthy list of some of the more, more apparent themes in Cathedral. Well, it's incorrect to simply repeat a theme or a couple of themes in a central idea statement. So it would be wrong to say something like, well, the central idea of Carver's story is bias, or the central idea of Carver's story is bias and enlightenment. No, no, those won't work by themselves. That might be a start, but that's not a central idea statement. A central idea statement can refer to theme or more than one theme, but it's got to say something about that theme or themes. It's got to say something critical about them. It's, it, in other words, it has to develop an idea around that theme in some way. And usually that way is going to involve character and the character's journey over the course of the story. So as we've said, central ideas are not direct references to story specifics, story content like character names, specific plot points, specific settings. We don't refer to any of that stuff in a central idea statement. Nor does a central idea statement um, simply be a one word theme or short phrase containing a couple of themes. A central idea statement is not an incomplete sentence. A central idea statement does not contain an undeveloped thought. Furthermore, a central idea avoids using the first person pronoun I and the second person pronoun you. Instead, in a central idea statement, we want to use the third person only if possible. And in order to avoid the gender issue, uh, we might try using plural pronouns, they and them and their. Uh, we might also use the first person pronoun one, which is kind of formal and it can make a statement sound a little awkward, but that also might be a possibility. We want to avoid the word should in a central idea statement. The word should suggests giving advice or making a, an argumentative claim of action. You know, we don't want to say that, well, the central idea is that people who are in this sort of situation should do this. We don't want to do that. We don't want to be prescriptive in a central idea statement. In a central claim statement, we're not dealing with those in this class, but in a central claim statement, that might be appropriate, but not in a central idea statement. Try 
to avoid the word about as well. The central idea of cathedral is about this, that, and the other thing. And that seems to be a, a lead into a list of themes, okay? So we want to try to avoid the word about. Try that, the word that instead. The central idea of cathedral is that when a person facing this sort of situation, yada, 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 yada. We'll get to some examples of good uh, central idea statements for Carver here in a few moments. So take a look at this example. I believe the central idea of Carver's story is about how you should move out of your comfort zone and have new experiences in order to counter your depression. There's some good stuff in here, I must say, but if you look at the underlined bits, <laughs> these are the parts of the statement that are sort of breaking the rules of composing a central idea statement. We want to avoid that first person. I, you know, I believe, I think, you know, it's your paper. You don't need to tell us that you think that. We know you think this because it's your, it's your essay. Your name is on it. So that's why we, we like to avoid the first person pronoun in general, you know, in academic writing, uh, unless we're referring to personal experience or something like this. Uh, there's the word about, and you, you know, now we're now we're sort of addressing the reader. Well, we don't want to do that. We don't want to necessarily just pin it to the reader. We want this statement to be applicable to a much larger group of people, not just the reader. There's that word should. That means we're being prescriptive. We're telling someone what they should do. And uh, I've lived long enough to know that people don't like being shoulded in general. So that's probably a, one more reason why we don't want to use the word should in central idea statements. And then we have a couple more examples of that second person pronoun, uh, in this case, the possessive pronoun your. So we'll take a look at another version of this sentence here in a little bit, and it, I'll show you how we can clean it up and make it a little bit better. A few more points about what a central idea is not. A central idea is not a truism, which is a, a word that refers to a generally accepted truth. Um, it's not an overly generalized statement that is terrifically distanced from the story. It is true that we need to back away from the story a little bit. We need to compose a sentence that is a little general because we can't refer to specific character names or specific situations in the story, settings in the story and so forth. You know, we can't refer to Bub, we can't refer to a blind man, we can't refer to an unhappy wife, we can't refer to any of these things in a central idea statement that's too specific. We've got to back away, but it is possible to back too far away, right? And then we get too general and we start coming up with ideas that really aren't very helpful. The central idea of the story is that people can be difficult, but can change. Like that's, that is such a general statement. It could apply to probably every story <laughs> that we read, right? Um, every story is going to be about people facing difficulty or being difficult and how they change. Uh, or maybe in some instances don't change. Um, so this this statement is just way too broad. It's what we might call a truism. Well, this is obviously true. So we don't want that as a central idea statement. We also don't want a central idea statement to be overly short or trite. Um, in other words, you know, flippant or, uh, you know, just sort of uh, unthoughtful. Uh, and we certainly want to try to avoid cliche. So here's a couple of examples of some sort of trite, cliched uh, ideas. The central idea of Carver's story is that there's none so blind as those who will not see. Or the central idea of Carver's story is that sometimes those who cannot see can be shown the light by those who can or something like that. 
right? We have all kinds of um, cliched expressions about, you know, the blind, the blind leading the blind. Uh, you know, we have this sort of mythic archetype about um, uh, very wise uh, figures who happen to be physically blind. And that's, that's an interesting thing to think about in Carver's story, but we wouldn't want to include this in a central idea statement itself. Okay, so let's get down to it. Let's take a look at some examples of quality, uh, good central idea statements for cathedral. Try this one. The central idea in cathedral by Raymond Carver is that when people with ignorant prejudices and no social lives break out of their shells and meet others who are the targets of those prejudices, they may discover things about themselves that they hadn't known. So notice there's no reference to Bub, there's no reference to Robert, we're being a little general here, referring to people with ignorant prejudices and no social lives. That certainly describes Bub, but it doesn't name him. Breaking out of their shells, meeting others, others who are the targets of those prejudices. That describes Robert, I think. But notice we're not mentioning his name. They may discover things about themselves that they hadn't known. Notice we're not being very specific about what that thing might be in Cathedral. And Carver isn't that terribly specific about it either, frankly. Uh, but we do have this notion of sort of breaking down barriers and coming to greater understandings. This is a pretty good uh, quality central idea statement, I think, for Carver. And notice, you know, it's not the shortest sentence on Earth. It's, it's a developed thought and it has several sort of working parts to it. Now, uh, I would be one of the last people on Earth to try to enforce a formula when it comes to understanding literature and art in general, but uh, I think a certain formula can be helpful when composing central idea statements. And that is when X, then Y, Z results. So let's investigate that a little bit. X refers to the character at the beginning of the story, the initial traits that the character exhibits, the qualities that the character is initially shown to have, why refers to the thing that the character deals with, the events, the issues, the conflicts, the problems that are faced by the character. And then Z, and I'm so sorry this isn't showing up here in the slide it seems, uh, Z is sort of the flip side of X. Z is the character as the character now appears by the end of the story. You know, that character has changed in some way. It might be a subtle way, like in Cathedral. It might be a more drastic way in other stories. Uh, but there's been some change in that character. So if we can capture an essential idea statement, these three things what we're doing is we're capturing the journey that that character has taken and we're focusing in on how that thing that the character had to deal with in the story changed the character from this way to this other way. And if we can put those three things together, we're doing a pretty good job at making a statement about the way human nature can work. Maybe not for everybody, maybe for everybody, it just depends on the story, but we're certainly looking at realistic human behavior in short stories, even though it's being given to us in a fictional stylized form. 
So consider this formula at work in this example of a central idea statement. Again, the central idea in Cathedral by Raymond Carver. By the way, it's a, it's a good idea to, to do this, to include the story title, full name of the author, kind of like you did in the very first plot summary sentence. Just do that again in your central idea statement if you can. The central idea in Cathedral by Raymond Carver is that when people with ignorant prejudices and no social lives break out of their shells and meet others who are the targets of those prejudices, they may discover things about themselves that they hadn't known. Well, here's X, right? People with ignorant prejudices and no social lives. That's Bub at the beginning of the story. That's his nature. That's his sort of his characteristics, his personality, so to speak, at the beginning of the story. And then the thing that happens to him, you know, when he breaks out of his shell and meets someone else who is sort of the target of those prejudices. You know, we have several bits in the story, early in the story, where the narrator is thinking to himself about blind people. And, uh, you know, what he thinks about them is just preposterous. Uh, he has these biases and prejudices against against blind people, right? So notice how we're wording it here, though. We're not referring to Bub. We're not referring to Robert. We're not referring to blind people. We're referring to people who are ignorant and prejudiced, who break out of their shells because of some situation, and they meet others who happen to be sort of the targets of their own biases well, what's the result of that when X and then Y, Z results? They may discover things about themselves that they had known. Notice we're using that third person plural pronoun throughout, right? Um, they, um, their shells. Uh, you know, early in the statement, we refer to people. We're not talking about men. We're not talking about women. We're, we're including anybody who might be prejudiced or biased, who has an encounter with someone who's the target of those biases. They break out of their shell and they come to a better understanding about themselves. So we're referring to sort of people in the third person in general. Here's that XYZ color coded for you. Once again, when people with ignorant prejudices and no social lives, that's X, break out of their shells and meet others who are the targets of those prejudices, that's Y, they may discover things about themselves that they hadn't known, that's Z. So this XYZ sort of formula can maybe help you, help remind you about what are the parts of a central idea that really need to go in there? If we can include something about that character and what they're like at the beginning of a story, and then write something about the experience that they have over the course of the story, and then capture what they're like as a result of that experience by the end of the story, once again, we're making hopefully a pretty solid statement about the way a human being or human beings can act in the world. Uh, Bub is certainly not alone. I mean, the world is full of people with biases and prejudices. And one of the remarkable things about Bub, as I've said before, is that he um, allows himself, you know, to, to break through. And uh, he allows himself to come into contact with someone who he, he does have biases about and, and is prejudiced against. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, the story is amazing for that, for that reason. And it's, uh, I must say, perhaps a very timely story in this, in this day and age. Now, one other aspect of the central idea that we want to mention is the use of qualifiers. 
in this example of the central idea, I'm using the qualifier may, right? These people who are ignorant and prejudiced, um, when they break out of their shells and meet others who are targets of their biases, they may discover things about themselves that they hadn't known. Bub does. I mean, at least he's beginning the journey, I think, of, of greater understanding and, and self-discovery. Uh, but that doesn't mean everyone will, will be like that out in the, the real world that you and I live in. So we do like to qualify ourselves when we make these central idea statements. We're not, we're not stating an absolute truth. We're not stating a situation that is always going to occur. Um, it, it will in some cases and it won't in other cases. And it will happen in a variety of ways along a spectrum, right? Realistically speaking. So we like to include qualifiers. And frankly, we like qualifiers when we write about literature in general. You know, just in, in the same way that uh, literature is ambiguous and we have multiple ways of looking at literature. We talked about that back in the part one of this presentation. Um, there are, you know, multiple possibilities of analysis and examination. So th this one way may be a good way. This understanding may be valid, but it may not be the only possible understanding. So we like to sprinkle qualifiers into these arguments in general. Of course, we got to be careful because if we qualify too much, we may not sound like we know what we're talking about, right? So sometimes, maybe, perhaps, uh, occasionally, often, um, these are all examples of qualifiers. Here's another example of a central idea for, for Carver. It's the same idea, just worded in a different way. The central idea in cathedral is that, in many cases, only by moving out of one's comfort zone, by having new experiences and meeting new people, can one break the cycle of unhappiness. So this is a, a slightly shorter version of the central idea. Um, it's not necessarily as explicit in terms of the X, Y, Z as the other uh, 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 other uh, example of the central idea statement. But I think this is, you know, a perfectly fine central idea statement for Carver. It ultimately is capturing those three things, right? In many cases, there's your qualifier only by moving out of one's comfort zone. There's that Y part of the X, Y, Z. By having new experiences and meeting new people, can one break the cycle of unhappiness? So the idea is that there's unhappiness at the beginning, that's the X, and the Z is about breaking that cycle of unhappiness. So all X, Y, and Z, they're all there in this sentence they're maybe just not quite as apparent as they were in the other example. This one is similar to that earlier example that I gave you that had the first person in it, right? The second person pronouns in it, the should. I took all those out, edited the statement, put in in many cases as a qualifier. So we were able to take that earlier sort of rough draft version that had you know, was, was breaking some of those rules and we cleaned it up, took that stuff out, put it in the qualifier, and we made this a pretty solid central idea statement as a result. Here's another example. The central idea in Carver's Cathedral is that sometimes people's ignorant prejudices about others can only be broken down when they open themselves up to encounters and new experiences with those whom they are misinformed about. Same idea as before. Um, certainly, this one is maybe more similar to the first one than the one we just looked at. All three of these examples are totally valid. I think strong examples of central idea statements. You know, there is some wiggle room in terms of wording. Uh, some readers might want to emphasize, you know, certain as maybe they want to emphasize Z, you know, over X. Uh, maybe they want to emphasize Y over X and Z. You know, as long as all three of them are there and it's clear, uh, 
chances are you're probably going to be writing a pretty solid central idea statement. Here in this example, uh, the central idea in Carver's Cathedral is that sometimes, there's your qualifier, sometimes people's ignorant prejudices about others, there's capturing sort of the X of Bub's initial personality, can only be broken down when they open themselves up to encounters and new experiences with those whom they are misinformed about. So there I think we've got the Y and the Z uh, sort of uh, merged together. Of course, all three of these things are in one sentence. And notice, all of these examples are only one sentence long. We do want a central idea statement to be captured in one sentence. And that sentence can be a long one, too. You know, it's possible to create a, a compound sentence with multiple clauses. You know, I've seen good central idea statements that employ, you know, semicolons. So that's not a problem. You know, as long as you can put all that stuff into one grammatically correct sentence, that's good. So the central claim of cathedral, here's an example of a central claim, is that even those without literal sight can sometimes see better than those with it. Uh, that's almost flirting a little bit with cliche, but now we're talking about a central claim, a central argument that Carver might be making. A central impression, remember impression is less about the head and more about the heart uh, and the gut, I suppose, and the soul. It's more about these uh, more maybe deeply felt um, impressions and reactions. The central impression of Carver's story is one of uplift and optimism, as we see how even a common and unhappy person can experience self-growth and perhaps even touch the divine through everyday human interaction. So we're, we're slipping in maybe a little bit of a spiritual reaction, if you're so inclined to that, uh, here in our central impression statements. So these are this would be an example of a central claim and a central impression. We're not writing those. I need to stress that. We are not writing those in our papers this term. But if you do pursue the A paper, uh, you might have the opportunity to work with, with something like this. So thank you very much. We're done with the, the central idea presentation now. Make sure you've watched uh, part one and two. Um, if you have any questions, if you want to you know, send me a, a central idea statement and see if you think it's any good, um, you know, bring it to office hours, email it to me, and we'll take a look at it.